If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being with us today. This is Christian Answers Presents. We've now been doing this program uh, since we first began as a cable access outreach in Austin, Texas, back in 1985. So we've been doing telecasts for a long time, and uh, each telecast has been on some different subject and how we relate biblical topics or biblical issues and what the scripture says to those topics and issues. So today we're going to talk about uh, an important character in Christian church history, Athanasius. And of course, to help us with this is our webmaster for our website, www.historycart.com, which is ancient church history. Uh, many people are totally ignorant of that subject, and uh, it is a subject that needs to be known uh, in this day and age because false prophets love to use early church history as a way to prop up their own false religions. Those at home may not know that my special guest for this broadcast is our director of research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. There he is right there on the screen. Uh, I was forced to give away his, his uh, situation when he brought that up about the misuse of early church history. But false prophets like to use anything they can to pervert the uh, obvious biblical truth that's there, either if they're perverting the Word of God itself or early church history. And Steve has done a great job in creating this website, www.historycart.com, in helping people just out there to just need a little direction and a way to study it for themselves, to keep from being deceived by all these religions that misuse it on a regular basis. Uh, and with that, Steve, uh, as I already introduced, uh, our subject today is Athanasius in church history. Now, obviously, people don't, most people that are watching this right now don't have a clue who he is, or much less a lot about early church history. Uh, before you begin on that, could you just uh, reiterate one more time a little bit about uh, your website, historycard.com, and then move right into the subject at hand, which would be Athanasius. Thank you. Well, historycard.com uh, just has a lot of uh, summaries of writings of early Christian writers. It also has uh, other writers, uh, historical stuff, also stuff about early Muslim writers for what Islam really taught and really teaches. You can just kind of search through that and, and, and see. And that's kind of a lot of it was taken from other websites, biblequery.org and muslimpope.com, but history card is just sort of the historical parts of it. But the stuff I'm saying today can be found all in history card or also in biblequery.org. Now, it's interesting you said something about Islam there and pertaining to your website. Uh, now, it seems that Islam might have had an impact on the, the church from about uh, 600 and on, 600 AD and on. Is, is, do you see any of that reflected in early church history? Uh, prior to 600 AD, none whatsoever, but uh, starting with John of Damascus, who uh, with his relative, I believe his uncle, was the one who let the Muslims into Damascus, um, and it gets more, com it's a complicated interaction, uh, but from that time on, there was that, and also some effort to read back into early church history, stuff that wasn't really there, as we'll find out a little bit later today. All right. Well, uh, today's subject is Athanasius. Now, uh, what's interesting about him is uh, we even mentioned him in one of our, our ministry newsletters, which I'm holding up right now. 
uh, our Christian Answers newsletter, a Christian Debater Guide, Volume 2, Number 2, way back. But, of course, I felt uh, in these newsletters we did over the years, over the decades, that uh, certain topics weren't being addressed enough by Christian churches in general. And so this one was on the testimony to the eternal Godhead, the Trinity. And, of course, the lead articles by Dr. Edward Bickerstaff, author of the book, The Trinity. Uh, and, of course, this has a lot of excellent material in it concerning what the Bible says about the Trinity. And as we go through from page to page here, uh, oh, the, here on page five, uh, our viewers at home can see uh, you there, Steve, uh, simple seven facts about the Trinity from your article, excellent article on the Trinity there. Uh, but as we, and on that very same page, on page five, next to Steve's art, article, we find uh, the Athanasian Creed down here on the uh, left-hand side of the page on page five. And it says right there, quote, we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty, majesty co-eternal, such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father is eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. Yet there are not three gods, but one God. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begot. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. And in this trinity, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal, so that in all things, as is aforesaid, the unity in trinity and the trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved must think of the trinity, end quote, quoted from Cyclopedia of Biblical Theology and Ecclesiastical Literature, New York, 1871, by John McClintock and James Strong, volume 11. I guess that's volume Roman number 2, page 560, 561. Yeah, right, yeah. So people at home were just seeing the Athanasian Creed, and with that as a setup, I'd like you to begin uh, our analysis <laughs> on Athanasian. All right. Athanasius is a complex and interesting guy. He was a good Christian. He wrote a ton about the Trinity, uh, and what he wrote was good. Um, actually, though, curiously enough, that the Athanasian Creed, as far as we know, was not actually written by Athanasius, but it was consistent with everything he taught. Uh, but he had such a stature as kind of a giant among Christian theologians that I, I found in my study of church history that he has kind of a unique place. I mean, there, pro there are, you know, maybe a, a, oh, eight or 900, you know, prominent theologians and writers throughout church history. And some of them, like uh, Augustine, uh, are, are very big in Roman Catholicism. They're also very big among Protestants. Uh, Greek Orthodox, not really at all. They don't like uh, 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 what Augustine said about sin. Others, like John Chrysostom, are very, very big with the Eastern Orthodox, but they aren't really very prominent or well-known with um, uh, Roman Catholics or, 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 or Protestants, um, though uh, Chrysostom was an outstanding expository preacher. But there's one guy who's kind of held in high esteem by all groups, uh, and that is Athanasius. Everybody likes Athanasius. Uh, Roman Catholics um, uh, refer to him. Protestants really, uh, really uh, refer to him. Not just us, but others too. Uh, not only that, uh, the Copts really consider him one of their own. He's from Alexandria. They like stuff. They study his stuff. Um, and Nestorians also really like Athanasius. So everybody pretty much kind of like that Athanasius. And 
with all that, um, what it actually did he say, and was Athanasius really a Roman Catholic? Was he really an Eastern Orthodox? Was he really an Evangelical um, or a Copt or an historian? And it turns out, uh, as kind of the summary version of this talk, he wasn't completely um, any of those. But we will see that he was as close to, you, you know, what, what, kind of one thing as, as he was another. And so, isn't there a scripture that says, beware when all men speak well of you? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you never criticize anything, that's true. But another, another way to be aware of that is that if um, they all speak well of you, then they might have a rosy-eyed view of what you said and, and not pay attention to some of your actual words. And I think that's kind of what happened here after he dies. Okay, I got you. I've read all of his writings, which are uh, pretty much in, in this book and uh, a few additional things. And there's also some stuff that claims to be by Athanasius, but is not by the early Athanasius of Alexandria. There are at least two other people in later times also named Athanasius. Uh, there's another thing he called Life of Anthony, which may have been by Athanasius. We're not sure. Kind of the jury's out on that, but there is a probability it was, and I looked at that too. All right. I don't kind of care for Athena calling him Athanasius the Great, which is what Eastern Orthodox call him, because it's too easy for people to idolize saints. But that being said, Athanasius really was a great Christian, and he had a very positive impact, but his teaching had a few some flaws too. So the, this video today is going to show Athanasius' teaching, and we can see how he says some things that might be uncomfortable for Eastern Orthodox. Some might be uncomfortable with the stories and cops. And yes, some things might be a little uncomfortable for evangelicals also, and as well as Roman Catholics. So we'll see what he has to say. First of all, let's talk about uh, the, some of his um, really positive contributions and good teaching. On the Trinity and the nature of the Christ, uh, he wrote against Arians. Now, Arians believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were God, but um, they believe that Jesus was of a different substance or else a lesser substance or else a similar substance, but not the same substance as God the Father, almost like some kind of demigod. And Athanasius wrote against that. And he wrote a, a, a whole lot about that, and what he wrote was a good stuff. He also wrote some about the sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, you might call it prima scriptura. He said that we should meditate on Scripture day and night. And he quotes Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, for example, in Easter letter 5, uh, chapter 1, page 517. Also, Easter letter, letter 11, page 6, 535. Here's a good quote from him. But since the Holy Scripture is of all things sufficient for us, therefore recommending to those who desire to know more of these matters, to read the divine word, I now hasten to set before you that which most claims attention, and for the sake of which principally I have written these things. This is to the bishops of Egypt, 356 A.D., uh, chapter 1.2, page 225. Okay, so since scripture is sufficient, there would be no essential doctrine of Christianity that's, different, that's missing from scripture. And of course, that would include venerating pictures of people. And we're going to see everything um, Athanasius said about venerating icons. Actually, he said nothing whatsoever, but we'll get to that later. All right, so Athanasius stressed the primacy of Scripture. All right, some people would like to say um, that, that maybe that meant sola scriptura. Well, to be honest, he did not actually go that far. Um, he recognized the authority of bishops also. So he said, if you really believe that all bishops have the same and equal authority, and you do not, as you assert, account them according to the magnitude of their cities. And he wrote this in Defense Against the Arians, uh, chapter 2.25, page 115. It also says, it is this that has thrown the churches everywhere into such confusion. For pretenses have been devised, and bishops of great authority in an advanced age have been banished for holding communion with me. This is his defense before Constantius, chapter 13, page 243 when he endured a lot of opposition from the Arian bishops who had been appointed there essentially by the emperor. Okay. And then Athanasius talked about how some contend against an ecumenical council, in this case the Council of Nicaea, on, uh, on the councils, chapter 33, page 468. So Athanasius uh, viewed the councils and bishops as having authority also. So you really can't say sola scriptura for Athanasius. 
Uh, he also said that the bishop, the church could not hold together without bishops, letter 49 to Dra uh, Dracontius, which is chapter 4, page 538. He also said, inventors of unlawful heresies, who indeed refer to the scriptures, but do not hold such opinion as the saints have handed down, and receiving them as the traditions of men err, because they do not rightly know them nor their power. So he's talking about traditions here. So Easter letter 2, chapter 6, page uh, 511. He appeals to apostolic tradition, letter 51, page 561 and 562. So Athanasius believed scripture was true, and he believed scripture had authority, but he also believed scripture had a sufficient authority. And, and this sounds just like what evangelicals say. But on the other hand, um, he was called Pope Athanasius, actually before any pope was called in Rome. He was strong in the authority of bishops in the Nicene Council. So it's sort of like an, an Eastern Orthodox person says. So on, on one hand, he says more like an evangelical would like to hear. On the other hand, he says more like something that an Eastern Orthodox or, or Roman Catholic would like to hear. How do we reconcile these two parts of, of, of Athanasius? And I think the best way is let's let Athanasius reconcile those two parts himself. <laughs> and what he says, for although sacred and inspired scriptures are sufficient to declare the truth, while there are other works of our blessed teachers compiled for this purpose, if he meet with which a man will gain some knowledge of the interpretation of scriptures and be able to learn what he wishes to know, still, as we have not at present in hands the compositions of our teachers, we must communicate in writing to you what we learn from them the faith, namely, of Christ the Savior, that any should hold cheap the doctrine taught among us or think faith in Christ unreasonable. This is an Athanasius against the heathen, uh, written 318 A.D., uh, part 1, chapter 1, dot 3, page 4. So evangelicals believe that early Christian writers are not infallible. Uh, however, their good teachings can be a reminder of Scripture and a check on our interpretation of Scriptures. So we don't know that Athanasius really uh, put these two together completely correctly, but he was certainly on the right track with the primacy of, 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 of scriptures. Now let's move on to say what Athanasius thought about pictures of God and statues. Okay, now kind of a reminder from our earlier show. The Roman Catholic Church, they will venerate statues and, and images of icons. The Eastern Orthodox Church does not venerate statues, but they do venerate picture, uh, uh, pictures or, 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 or images of saints or Christ or um, you know things like that. So Athanasius said not to portray the deity in human or animal form. Here's what he says. And generally, if they conceive the deity to be corporeal so that they can try for it and represent belly and hands and feet and neck also and breast and the other organs that go to make man, see to what impiety and godlessness their mind has come down to just have, have such ideas of deity, dot, dot, dot. But these and like things are not properties of God, but rather of earthly bodies. He said this in Against the Heathen, chapter 22, page 15 and 16. He also goes on to say, For ye carve the figures for the sake of the apprehension of God, as ye say, but invest the actual images with the honor and title of God, thus placing yourselves in a profane position. This is Against the Heathen, chapter 21.1, page 15. So all Eastern Orthodox believe this about statues, and the Greek Orthodox, but not... Uh, completely the Russian, they consistently believe that you should not have pictures of God the Father. Russian Orthodox, they have taught on one hand that you shouldn't have pictures of God the Father, but they have a very famous icon that has a picture of God the Father as a man and and, and, and a picture of God the Son and God the Holy Spirit as three men uh, talking with Abraham. All right, but regardless, they venerate pictures of, of Jesus and saints, and Athanasius was totally unaware of any Christians do anything like this? It's just not what the uh, the scripture would have us to, to go with. When you think about idols, you have references like in First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter sixteen, verse twenty-six, First Corinthians chapter ten, nineteen to twenty-two, First Corinthians chapter eight, verses four through six, and uh, and then when we have here, I just wanted the viewers at home to see this. You look in. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, you, the people at home can see, see the references there to all these pagan idolaters and things of that, and that's, that like that. But then you see there, but thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves 
and burn their graven images with fire. You can also see in Second Chronicles chapter 34, verses 3 through 7, you find, once again, mentions about the cutting down the groves, and carved images, and molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them, and, you know, scattered that dust over the graves of them who had sacrificed unto them, and so forth. You're basically told about the cut down all the idols throughout the land of Israel, uh, return to Jerusalem as one of the kings of Israel. I think it was Josiah here. And so you have plenty of references in the scripture about uh, idolatry. And to me, it's interesting, these references I just gave are clearly anti-Israel, or as we can look at modern-day, anti-Christian practices. It's sort of like if uh, Jehovah's Witnesses built altars and, and, and idols with statues and pictures, or the Mormons did it. You know, we clearly think, well, they're not Christians to begin with. And that's what we're looking at here. These people are not real Israelites. They're worshiping other gods. But at the same time, you think about what uh, John says in 1 John 5, 21. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And there's plenty of other references. Uh, but you can have idolatry within what's called the Christian church. Now, we're looking at these things that we know are outside the Christian church. But then the devil, being so cunning as he is, can actually incorporate idolatry inside what's called the Christian church. So we have to watch out on the outside and the inside. Kind of reminds me of uh, what Paul warned the elders about there in Acts chapter 20, about among your own selves shall come those who have you seek after them and they'll cause division inside the church. So there's a problem there when it comes to idolatry, uh, whether inside or outside. Uh, there's a problem with uh, those who call themselves Christians engaging in yet trying to excuse it as something else. And uh, the pagan idolaters are doing basically the same thing that these guys are claiming to be Christians are doing. But, oh, for some reason it's different. But anyway, I could go on and all this. So anyway, I've put in... Okay. And so proceed, brother. All right. Well, thank you. So with idolaters and even trying to other people and Arians, what did Athanasius say about persecuting others? Um, should you spread the truth by the sword? Well, here's what he said. If it be a bad thing to flee, it is much worse to persecute. For the one party hides himself to escape death, and the other persecutes with a desire to kill. This, in defense of his flight, chapter 8, page 257, this is in the context of the Arians who are out to get him and kill him. So he was against persecuting others. He also says, it is the true part of godliness, not to compel, but to persuade. And this is in History of the Arians, chapter 67, page 29. If only the historical Roman Catholic Church had heeded Athanasius. Also, another kind of blight upon Augustine is that Augustine did support persecution of heretics, and but Athanasius says don't persecute anybody. So that kind of makes, to me, makes Athanasius stand kind of head and shoulders above some other later people. Okay, uh, moving on, we, we looked at little individual points that were good teaching. Let's look at things kind of overall. Um, the, Athanasius wrote, if you have a book about, let's say, this size, uh, wrote about 468 pages, uh, uh, 56 of which were before the Nicene Council. And in these 468 pages, which is uh, a lot of pages, it's actually pretty densely packed with good stuff. He wrote at least 576 teachings that four or more pre-Nicene Christians taught and none denied, and Christians today would agree with. That's a lot of stuff. Okay. Of course, Athanasius hit the big things, like Jesus redeemed us by bearing our sins, rising from the dead, but even minor things like the abomination of causes of death, desolation, naturally and Laban, you know, minor uh, biblical characters. I mean, he knew scripture we went backwards and forwards uh, uh, over it. There are uh, about a total of uh, about 1,100 or so teachings that four more pre nicene Christians taught and none denied. And Athanasius wrote on more than half of them. All right. And these, by the way, if you want to see all of them, are at https colon slash slash www.biblequery.org slash doctrine, slash doctrinal statements, and slash Athanasius taught, and you look at html.doc. Okay, and you can uh, also see 
www.biblequery.org slash history slash church history slash what Nicaea to Ephesus Christians taught HTML or doc. And you can see Nicene to pre-Nicene, Nicene to Ephesus Christians taught, including Athanasius. And then you can compare that with what the early Christians taught at www.biblequery.org slash history slash church history slash what early Christians taught dot HTML or doc. And have you ever read something and said, you know, I'm not sure I agree with this. And then after you've pondered it a while, uh, you say, you know, that's absolutely right. And, and, and I changed my thinking, and I do agree with that. Well, I kind of had that moment, uh, moment like that reading Athanasius. Athanasius had a brilliant point. He said, polytheism is atheism. Now I said, well, now wait a second. You know, okay, one God is not atheism. But if you have multiple gods, that would seem to me on the surface – Farther than atheism, than you know, even one God. But um, Athanasius had a brilliant point here. You know, we believe as Christians that there is one eternal being who exists, is all powerful, and is a governor of all. He knows all, he can do whatever he wishes. Atheists believe that it's empty up there, so to speak. Okay. Now, polytheism typically has lots of gods and goddesses that act pretty much like people except with greater powers. I mean, think of the Avengers or something like that. They're, they're just people with, that can do special things. But behind the gods, most polytheists also believe it is, quote, empty. Athanasius said, for the rule of more than one is the rule of none. For each one would cancel out the rule of the other, and none would appear ruler, but there would be anarchy everywhere. So I thought, that's a brilliant thought that, if you believe in tons of gods and goddesses, there's no one who really made everything, who's eternally existent, everything of that. And they're really no better than atheists who believe that they're beings with some special powers. I've always uh, kind of agreed with that without knowing Athanasius had made this very uh, enlightened statement about it. Because I've always looked at a, most religionists that don't really take, they don't really take Christ that seriously or uh, the biblical gospel. Uh, as practical atheists. In other words, they claim to be Christians, let's say, but yet they don't really live their lives from day to day as if there's a God at all. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they, they think maybe going to, like I used to be doing before I became a Christian on May 16, 1981, I was raised in a Christian church, but I was a nominal one. And I thought, well, if I go to church on Christmas and Easter, most of the time I skipped Easter, I'd just go uh, at Christmas. That that was good enough to get me into heaven, you know, because it's sort of like a fire insurance policy. You know, uh, you know I'm, I'm tipping my hat to God. Oh, okay. I'll, and that's good enough. But the rest of the time, I was living like an atheist, basically. I was living like God's way over here in some box. And I don't know if I can, I'll bring him out at Christmas time. I'll go give him a little worship and, and, and I'll put him back in a box and not worry about him. And I'll live my life the way I jolly well please. And that's what a lot of religionists do. So sort of like what Athanasius was saying here, a lot of these people are practical atheists, even though they have some claim about a deity, whether it be multiple gods like Mormons or a singular god like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever else is out there. Well, with all the stuff that Athanasius wrote, and he wrote on a ton of topics, there are some things that Athanasius was silent about. And one of these uh, particularly is kind of interesting. For example, uh, unfortunately, Athanasius, he never affirmed or denied that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Evangelical sure wish he would have said that, but he actually didn't say that. The other thing he's silent on, and we'll look at this in more detail, is that he, he said nothing about venerating images. He didn't speak really against it because he'd never heard of it. All right, so in his writings, he, he never mentioned venerating images of Jesus or people or anything else. However, um, this was, quote, unquote, fixed. It, and let me tell you how it was fixed. A historian Agapius in 593 A.D., now this is a couple of centuries after Athanasius, he records this uh, story about a Jewish person who rented the house of a Christian, and he found a picture of a Virgin Mary in the house. And so he urinated on it. And after it was discovered, the Jews were expelled of the city. Okay? Now, so far, I've told you nothing that relates to Athanasius, who died in 373 AD. However, some years later, an anonymous legend tells the same story, essentially, of a Jewish person rented a Christian's house on Icon of Christ, and 
the, the crucifixion was reenacted on the icon because the icon bled. And then the Jews and those around him were converted. This was told by a Bishop Athanasius, who, uh, this is a, a, a different guy who went to the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which is called the Council of Nicaea II, which is in 787 AD. Now, note this Athanasius was 400 years after Athanasius of Alexandria. At least one Greek Orthodox person thought this was the same Athanasius as the First Council of Nicaea. I was told this um, you know, with email, but also you can see this at https colon slash phoenicia.org slash statue and icon dot html uh, for more info. So there's a different guy named Athanasius who lived over four years later who basically took a kind of an accreted legend that was told in one way and then added on later and was told by a, a different guy named Athanasius and some people have projected that back to the original Athanasius and says, aha, Athanasius did talk about icons after all. Well, different Athanasius. Um, and also there's some question is that did the later Athanasius really say this or was this his name put on it too? Okay. Another thing that Athanasius never said in all the writings that he had, even things like Laban, which, you know, just a minor character in Genesis, he never talked about ever praying to Mary or the saints. Now, this got, quote, fixed too. There is a very famous, quote, prayer of Athanasius to Mary in later Roman Catholic writings. So you say, aha, Athanasius did pray to Mary. However, there's no reference where Athanasius ever wrote or said this. Uh, likewise, there is a homily in Papyrus of Turin 71-216 in Gambero, as 106. It's supposedly by somebody named Athanasius. Doesn't say which Athanasius, and we do not know who claimed it was by any Athanasius. Now, the other thing is that when you look at Eastern Orthodox writings, this prayer of Athanasius, remember, Eastern Orthodox really like Athanasius. They have no mention of this, at least not that I've seen anywhere. So this thing, I think, was made up by the Western Church, and then the Eastern Church said, no, we'll just reject these spurious things. Okay, so he was silent on these crucial things and the writings that we do have. If these are so important to the gospel or so important to Christianity, and he was totally silent, um, I think his silence speaks volumes here. Definitely, because if they were so important, he would have definitely mentioned all of that, brain to Mary and so forth. I would prefer just to stop here say Athanasius is a great guy uh, and, he's, and he's almost never wrong and end of story. Well, we, we, we can't stop here. Uh, we, we're going to go on and see the stuff that he said and we, I have a little code here in that when you see something that, that says, oh, that means that Eastern Orthodox or Orthodox would disagree with this. R means Roman Catholics would disagree. E means Evangelicals would disagree. And if it's in lowercase, it means some would agree and some disagree. So one thing that evangelicals think is a poor terminology is calling Mary the mother of God, or it can be translated Mary the bearer of God. In Greek, it's calling Mary Theotokos. Okay, and evangelicals would disagree with that. They say, yes, Mary certainly was the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is fully divine. But they would say, but he's not really the mother of God the Father, and Mary's not the mother of God the Holy Spirit. And actually, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, they don't say Mary's the mother of the Father the Holy Spirit either. But when you say mother of God, it just seems kind of like too imprecise a language. All right, so here's what Athanasius said. John, while yet in the womb, leapt for joy at the voice of Mary, mother of, bearer of God. This is in Four Discourses Against the Arians, Discourse 3, Chapter 26. Uh, page 411. Also chapter 33, page 412. And uh, also another reference to. Also, he, he, here's a quote from him. Whence also, whereas the flesh is born of Mary, bearer of God, he himself, referring to Jesus, is said to have been born, who furnishes to others an origin of being. So he's kind of showing the paradox of how Jesus was born of Mary, and yet Jesus created the universe. So he said Mary was, was the bearer of God. Four Discourses Against the Arians, Discourse 3, Chapter 34, page 412. So Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, and Roman Catholic, they all say that Mary was the bearer of God. The Council of Ephesus in 431 AD pronounces anathema not only against Nestorius, who denied that, but also against all who don't anathematize those who deny that. So if you don't say that uh, Mary was the bearer of God, or you don't say the people are cursed of God if they don't say Mary's the bearer of God, then you are cursed of God 
according to the Council of Ephesus in 431 A.D. You know, I'm not so sure I really like the Council of Ephesus in 431 A.D. <laughs> it's like the Judaizers that Paul uh, railed against in the book of Galatians, particularly in chapter 1 there, verses nine, 6 through 9, uh, because they were just, as far as we know about the Judaizers in Galatians, uh, their only beef was to say, well, if you're going to be a real Christian, you've got to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. There's no mention of anything else beyond that that we can read in Galatians outside of circumcision. But that seems to be just a simple add-on to the gospel. But Paul just blasts them for doing that and anathematizes them for adding just that one little thing of circumcision. Now, here's the Council of Ephesus adding what a beautiful damn these guys over here for, for holding something that disagrees with us over, over there, well, then you're in that, you're, you're going to hell. You know? <laughs> so right, right. You're adding other qualifications to the gospel just for the fact that you're, if you don't, you're going to hell if you don't agree with what we say here. And that's a, that seems to be going far beyond what we see the Judaizers do that Paul so uh, vociferously denounced. Now, when the story is did was messed up on uh, the nature of Christ, the fact that they kind of went overboard with that. Now, let me try to explain, especially to Eastern Orthodox, why it is that Protestants don't like the term mother of God or bearer of God. First of all, it's not scriptural. There's so many titles of Jesus and there's so many things in scripture that we need to believe and follow. It's like, well, why do we need to add this thing that, that was a, a, a term uh, coined by man? Now, as long as you understand about the Trinity and the divinity of Christ, uh, and those particular things, which Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Protestants, Copts, and historians agree upon, you know, that's good. But this term is not really scriptural. Also, as I said earlier, you know, bearer of God, she's the bearer of Christ. I'll be happy to say that, but I don't like to say anything that sounds like she's the bearer of the Father and the Holy Spirit. At least that will confuse, uh, can confuse some non-Christians even though the other groups don't believe that Mary was bearer of the Father or the Holy Spirit either. So if it's kind of a, a term that leads to misconceptions, why use the term if it's not, if it's not even scriptural? Okay, so why don't you just call it the, the Virgin Mary is the mother of the Son of God? You know, why can't we just say that? That would be fine. Another thing that Athanasius said is he said Mary was an ever virgin, meaning that she didn't have any children ever besides Jesus, of course. And he said this in four discourses against the Arians, Discourse 2, Chapter 70, page 386 to 387. He was not the first. Prior to him, we know of two writers who also affirm this, Hippolytus and Peter of Alexandria. Peter of Alexandria lived about the same time as Athanasius, just a little bit uh, older. So evangelicals would be against that because, you know, the New Testament talks about Jesus' as brothers and sisters. And James was a brother of Jesus, you know, the half-brother. But then... At least Roman Catholics say, oh, that, you know, brothers and sisters must be cousins there because if it meant real brothers and sisters, then they couldn't believe Mary was an ever virgin. Now, Matthew 125 it doesn't say that Joseph had no union with Mary. He said Joseph had no union with Mary until Jesus was born. And also it mentions that Jesus' brothers in Matthew 12, 46 to 47, Matthew 13, 55, Mark 3, 31 and 32. Luke 8, 19 and 20, John 2, 12, and John 7, 3 through 10. Okay, with all these places, the idea that they're cousins is not mentioned once in the Bible or in pre-Nicene writers. The word is not unknown. The word cousin is in the New Testament, Colossians 4, 10, but not related to Jesus. So if they, if they were cousins, the Bible just could have said cousins, you know, but it said brothers. And when the Bible and later church tradition contradict each other, we should believe the Bible. Correct, because... Look at a situation where you marry your wife, and then she has a divine interaction with the deity as a child, and then you're expected in this marriage for the rest of your life never to, you know, come together with your wife uh, for the entire time. Even that's inconsistent with the way God has things set up when it concerns marriage, or to be... Uh, Fruitful and multiply. That's part of what marriage is about. And uh, yeah, this doctrine here would say, well, Joseph, you just, you know, you can't, you can't do anything with your wife now. She's just gotta, you just gotta 
you know, that, that doesn't make any sense in the biblical context of what we know from Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. So evangelicals would, would differ with what Athanasius said about that. You think Athanasius? Yeah, well, so Athanasius is just wrong on that. Point. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, and unfortunately, it's not the only place. Um, here's a place that Orthodox, Roman Catholics, and evangelicals, in reading Athanasius, this part would all say that he was wrong. Okay, Athanasius was kind of Nestorian leading in one spot. When it says that uh, no one knows the day of the, of the hour of Christ's return, not the Son, only the Father, then Athanasius says, but why, though he knew, he said, no, not the Son knows. And he says, this I think none of the faithful is ignorant, viz, that he made this as those other declarations, as many by reasons of the flesh. Nestorians uh, teach us, and Nestorius himself is kind of questionable how far he went with this, but later Nestorians went farther. They teach that Christ had two wills and one body. It's like there was a human Christ and there was a divine Christ. And so they, the human Christ submitted to the Father and the divine Christ, but it's like two wills, almost like a, not quite two beings, but getting there. And while we say no, Orthodox, Catholics, Evangelicals, and Protestants, they all say no. Christ had two natures, human and divine, but there's only one Christ. When we pray, we don't pray to two Jesuses. There's only one Jesus. But historians kind of split up in the, the two wills in a way that's kind of weird and, it, and is unbiblical. Okay. Anyway, let me go back to this quote and see if this sounds uncomfortably Nestorian to you. But why, though he knew, he said, no, not the Son knows, he here being Christ. This, I think, none of the faithful is ignorant. This, that he made this as those other declarations, as many by reason of the flesh. For this is not, is, as before, is not the word deficiency, but of that human nature whose uh, property it is to be ignorant, dot, dot, dot. Certainly, he says in the gospel concerning himself and his human character, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son. It is plain that he knew also the hour of the end of all things as the word, though as man he is ignorant of it, for ignorance is proper to man, and especially the ignorance of those things, dot, dot, dot. For since he was made man, he is not ashamed because of the flesh, which is ignorant to say, I know not, that he may show that knowing is God, but he is ignorant, but ignorant according to the flesh. And therefore he said, no, not the Son of God knows, lest the Godhead should seem ignorant, but simply, no, not the Son, that the ignorance might be the sons as born from among men. So if you can, uh, this is in four discourses against the Arians, Discourse 3, Chapter 43, Quotes 417. So if you can follow this contorted thinking, it's like the Son of God was not ignorant, but the Son of Man was. So we're talking about two sons here in one body. Okay, I really don't like this, and I think any Christian from the Council of Ephesus on, the kicked off in the historians, wouldn't like this either. So this is kind of a problem. You know, did Jesus know or did he not know? Well, Athanasius says yes on one hand and no on the other hand. Yes, as far as uh, he's the Son of God knew, but the Son of Man didn't know. Well, they're the same one, okay? One can understand now why Nestorians admire Athanasius so much. Even though saying Mary is a bearer of God is anathema or horrible to Nestorians, they still like Athanasius despite that because he said this, okay? Now, what the Bible says, though, the Bible never even hints that Jesus was two beings or two minds in one body. Colossians 2.19 says the fullness of God dwelled in him. And Hebrews 1.3 says the Son is the exact representation of God's being. Yet Hebrews 2.14 says he shared in our humanity. And Hebrews 2.17 says that Jesus was made like us in every way. So the Bible is clear there are two natures, but not two wills. So the mystery of the incarnation is that Jesus was every bit as human as we are, except without sin. And he's every bit as much God as the Father. Okay. Well, that's, the, that's tying in with the historical Christian doctrine of the hyperstatic union of Christ. Uh, so that's why Nestorianism is considered a heresy in this, in this regard. And the opposite extreme of Nestorianism is monophysitism. And the, and the Council of, of Ephesus in 431 kicked out the Nestorians, and the Council of Chalcedon uh, kicked out the monophysites. So I look to Athanasius' writings and say, 
well, can I find some teachings that are more monophysite than they are orthodox? And at least in my reading, I, I've not found anything that was monophysite leading, but only Nestorian leading. Now, another thing that Roman Catholics and Evangelicals and Orthodox would disagree with, per, perhaps um, Pops and Nestorians too, though I haven't verified that, is Nestorians really mired the teacher Origen. Now, Origen was one weird guy. If you think of the essential doctrines of Christianity, Origen affirmed all those. But he had some weird ways of allegorizing the Bible. He also believed that everyone would eventually go to heaven, maybe after being in hell for a while, including Satan. He didn't believe in reincarnation. He was against that. But he believed souls preexisted. Athanasius, in my opinion, admired Origen too much. Here's what he said. In concerning the everlasting coexistence of the Word with the Father, and that he is not of another essence or substance, but proper to the Father's, as the bishops in the council said, you may hear again from the labor-loving origin also. For what he has written as if inquiring and by way of exercise, that no one take as expressive of his own sentiment, but of parties who are contending in investigation, but what he definitely declares, that is the sentiment of the labor-loving band. This is in defense of the Nicene definition, chapter 27, page 168. Okay. Now, there are at least five other pre-Nicene writers who origin is. So this was kind of a problem with the early Christianity and that they liked him too much, and including Athanasius. And others so, saw there was a problem here. Uh, another thing that Athanasius said that I really don't like is he talked about the collective guilt of the Jews. Okay. First of all, when Jesus was at the trial, and you remember when the crowd of people, Pilate asked, said, do you want to give me free Barabbas or free Jesus, and they all said free Barabbas. You know, how many people were in that? You know, was it the whole city? Who was it? Well, it turns out that they have excavated where they think is the place that this happened, and it could have held at most maybe 400 people, maybe maybe 500. And so, and a lot of them were probably hand-picked, you know, by, by the scribes and Pharisees to be there. So it's one thing to say that Jewish people, you know, were involved in crucifying Jesus, that's true. But to say the collective guilt of all Jewish people, that's not right. That's going too far. Well, unfortunately, Athanasius in 339 A.D., he wrote about desecration of the churches in Alexandria, and he said they, meaning the heathen soldiers, that is non-Jewish, you know, pagans, were burning the books of Holy Scripture which they found in the church. And the Jews, the murderers of our Lord, and godless heathen entering irreverently, he says, O oh, strange boldness, the holy baptistry. This is in Circular Letter 3, page 94. All right, this is regrettable that he kind of stereotyped the Jews as the murderers of our Lord. However, the slight piece of good news, Athanasius did not say anything against the Jews or against Jewish people uh, beside this. But I sure wish he hadn't said this either, because this, you don't say this. This is not accurate to say about Jewish people. Jesus' dialogue with uh, Pontius Pilate is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 19. And when you look at uh, verse 11 there, Jesus uh, is talking to Pilate, and he said, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And you can cross-reference that to Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the crucifixion story overall, uh, Jesus himself said to Pontius Pilate that uh, the ones who turned him over to Pilate were guilty of the greater sin. Right. Overall, all I'm saying is the Jews are culpable in this thing, just like the Romans and everyone else. But... Uh, and this is all in the predestined plan of God. Uh, but basically, well, what you're saying, yeah, I don't, when I'm dealing with Jewish people on the street today or wherever, you know, I'm not looking at them the same way uh, as back then with that crowd of scribes and Pharisees and Caiaphas, you know, and those guys that are plotting against Christ who are guilty of the greater sin. Uh, but we see the culpability of all these people against Christ at his crucifixion. Well, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, the, the, the leaders, the scribes, and the Pharisees were against Jesus. But you remember, all the people of the first church 
uh, we're all we're all Jewish people. So it, uh, yes, there was a, a great deal of guilt for the for the people involved, but you don't extend it to an entire race. Someone could be Jewish, and um, they may not ever want to come to Christ and tell you so, and you can still be their friend. Uh, another thing that maybe isn't as serious about people, but this is just a mess up, is he said that jealousy has no place with God. Athanasius said we should not ascribe jealousy to God in four discourses against the Arians, Discourse 2, chapter 29, page 363. That sounds nice and logical and stuff, except Scripture says the opposite. <laughs> scripture said God has jealousy, jealousy for people worshiping others and idols. In Exodus 25, 34, 14, Deuteronomy 4.24, Deuteronomy 5.9, Deuteronomy 6.15, Joshua 24.19, Nahum 1.2, Zechariah 8.1, and 1 Corinthians 10.22. Athanasius was very well versed in scripture, but he kind of flipped up here. And sometimes um, people, even people today, Roman Catholics, Evangelicals, Orthodox, anybody, we can sometimes get so caught up in studying theology that we don't spend enough studying scripture. And if scripture disagrees with our theology, then that's an opportunity for us to grow and change our theology. Uh, when I find that my theological views don't agree with the Bible, I just want to go with the Bible. And I think every, everyone ought to be a biblicist. And, and we not, may not be interpreting things perfectly, but that's why we kind of have each other to keep each, to keep each other in check, you know, to do that. Another thing is that Athanasius was inconsistent on the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha isn't one thing. The Roman Catholic Church today has some Old Testament books that are not in the Protestant Bible or the Jewish Bible, and they are called Apocrypha, and most people think that's all there is. Well, the Eastern Orthodox, they have books that are Apocrypha that is the same as the Roman Catholic, plus a few extra books. And the Coptic Church has some Apocryphal books uh, that are in addition to that. So there are various books that uh, some Christians have accepted as scripture on a lesser level or even scripture on the same level. And Athanasius, rather than saying all that was wrong, like we have evangelicals with kind of hope, um, he didn't actually say it was right. He was kind of inconsistent on it also. So here's what he said about it. It's a little complicated. He said, but since we have made mention of heretics as dead, but of ourselves as possessing the divine scriptures for salvation. And since I fear lest, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, some few of the simple should be beguiled in simplicity and purity by the subtlety of certain men, and should henceforth read other books, those called apocryphal, led astray by the similar of the names of the true books, I beseech you to bear patiently, if I also write by wherever matters which you are acquainted, influenced by the need and advantage of the church. This is an Easter letter to 367 A.D., chapter 2, page 551. So what books would be apocryphal books that he says aren't so good? So it's, this sounds great from the uh, evangelical perspective so far. However, in chapter 7, page 554, he says the books of, of Wisdom, Sirach, Judith, Tobit, which are in the Roman Catholic Apocrypha, Teachings of the Apostles, which is not, and the Shepherd, meaning Shepherd of Hermas, he said they're not included in the canon, so they're not a part of the Bible, but he said they're still good to read. Okay? So he was like kind of positive toward them, but they weren't really scripture. Okay? Then in 367 AD, and this is a long quote, I apologize, but for greater exactness, I add this also, writing necessity. But there are other books beside those, not indeed including the canon, but appointed by the fathers to be read by those who newly join us, who wish for instruction in the word of godliness. The wisdom of Solomon the wisdom of Sirach and Esther and Judith and Tobit and that which is called teaching of the apostles and the shepherd. But the former, meaning Old New Testament books, are included in the canon. The latter are merely read. Nor is there any place to mention of apocryphal writings. But they are an invention of heretics who write them when they choose. Dot, dot, dot. So using them as ancient writings, they may find occasions to lead us straight as simple. It is in Easter letter 39, chapter 7, page 552. Athanasius, on one hand, he was like, writing against all these made-up books by heretics. And so he said, stick to the canon, stick to the scriptures, which would be the Old and New Testament that we have today. That sounds great. But then he adds, but these other books are really good to read, and so um, read these also. So if you stop here, it sounds like, okay, so he accepts that these aren't scripture, but they're good to read. However, maybe inconsistent with this, 
He also, Athanasius also quoted as scripture, Barak, Wisdom, Sirach, and two additions to Daniel. He quoted from Suzanne and Daniel also. So he quoted from Wisdom 624 and Sirach 189 of Scripture and four discourses against the Arians, Discord 2, chapter 79, page 391. He lists the books of the Old Testament uh, like our list, except he also has Barak. Barak, uh, by the way, was a secretary of Jeremiah. In Easter letters, uh, 367 AD, chapter 4, page 552, he quotes the Scripture Daniel 14, 5, which is the story of Bel and the dragon. The dragon was this dead idol but a uh, Babylonian priest, according to the story, you know, uh, people make offerings to it, and he proved that the dragon, you know, wasn't there. But anyway, in Four Discourses Against the Arians, Discourse 3, Chapter 30, page 410, he quoted from the story of Susanna in Four Discourses Against the Arians, Discourse 1, Chapter 13, page 314, and also in uh, uh, Athanasius on Psalms. And he quoted from Tobit 4.18, right after Matthew 6.6 6 and Isaiah 32.6. 6. So he didn't actually say it was scripture, but he quoted it right in line with the other scriptures uh, with no delineation at all. Defense before Constantius, chapter 7, page 244. Some cases he said they weren't scripture, but they're good to read. But in these cases, he said it was scripture. So, again, Athanasius lived a fairly long life. And I guess you, maybe someone who lives that long can't always be consistent on everything. Uh, could you just tell for a moment uh, a little our viewers uh, about that your apocryphal section on biblequery.org? All I do there basically is list uh, different apocryphas that different groups have. Um, and actually, I think the original King James Bible had the apocrypha in it, the very first version, and then it wasn't in anymore. I also show uh, some of the problems with the apocrypha. Uh, there are a lot of a provable historical accuracies, especially in the book of Judith. And if someone wants to be a genuine Christian and they also believe in the Apocrypha, they usually will not believe that Scripture is inerrant. And I can understand. They can't really believe Scripture is inerrant if they believe the Apocrypha Scripture, especially the book of Judith. Okay? Now, there are some other books like First Maccabees and uh, Second Maccabees that in many cases aren't so bad. They're basically just history, except, in, except they do talk about uh, making prayers for the dead which we say is not a part of Scripture, but then they say, yes, it is, because they think Maccabees are Scripture. So it just shows some of the inconsistencies and problems if someone believes the Apocrypha is Scripture, and the Apocrypha was in the Septuagint, which was translated by Jewish people in Alexandria, Egypt, in the Greek, and the Jewish people in Palestine, from what we can tell, had almost no knowledge of the Apocrypha. But if someone only had a Greek Bible and the Greek Bible the Apocrypha in it, you could understand why they... Thought that. Uh, Jerome was a fascinating figure. He's the one who translated the Vulgate, and I believe I would call him a very first rate scholar for his time. He uh, believed the Apocrypha was all scripture initially. And then after he studied it more, he said it wasn't scripture, but it was still good to read. So it's interesting, but of course he translated the Vulgate all by the time that he put the Apocrypha in. But it's interesting how his views kind of changed over time. So another thing that, but not all, evangelicals would disagree with is he said that the Eucharist had the real presence of Christ. So let me give the quote first, and then I'll give you the context of what people believe about that. So Athanasius says, so long as the prayers and invocations have not been made, it is mere bread and a mere cup. But when the great and wondrous prayers have been recited, then the bread becomes the body and the cup the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, dot, dot, dot. When the great prayers and holy supplications are sent up, the word descends on the bread and the cup, and it becomes his body. And this is a fragment attributed to Athanasius. It could be genuine or false, but in this case, we don't have any real evidence that it's false. And this is in Sermon to the Newly Baptized by J. D. Kelly, page 442. Okay, now let me give you some context of this. Many Protestants say that, that when Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you, and this is blood shed for the remission of sins, that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Okay, so it's not that Jesus' body was physically there after, you know, in subsequent times. And then during the very first, you know, the Last Supper, it's not that Jesus all of a sudden had two bodies. You know, he was still there in his human body. Okay, but Jesus said it was a remembrance. And so most Protestants say it's a remembrance. Okay. Uh, Roman Catholics believe in transubstantiation, with uh, actually a couple of exceptions in history, but for the most part, they say it's no longer bread and wine. It now becomes his body and blood. 
okay? Uh, Lutherans are kind of in between. Lutherans believe in consubstantiation. They say it remains the, the bread and wine, so don't worship it, <laughs> but it also becomes the body and blood. So they're kind of in between. And then Eastern Orthodox, I've seen two different views. One view says somehow it becomes his body and blood, and it's a mystery, and we don't know how. Okay? And a second view of Eastern Orthodox says, well, we're really not that much different from Catholicism and transubstantiation. But Athanasius, from this fragment, he was definitely on the Roman Catholic slash Lutheran slash Eastern Orthodox side. It's hard to believe any of that simply because uh, uh, when you read like Matthew chapter 26 at uh, the Last Supper where Jesus is sitting there at the table and he's handing out the, the bread and the wine and he tells them, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my, my blood. And he's, so, but he's sitting right there at the table. And mm -hmm. this is bread and this is wine and they're drinking it, they're eating it, but it's obviously not part of them. <laughs> right. It, it, it said, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, so, I can remember debating a Roman Catholic scholar in television studio, Dr. Prestige from St. Edwards University, and I brought that up, and he didn't really know how to handle that because, you know, obviously that's the real, that's the you know, that's the supper right there at the table. But Jesus is sitting at the table, and that, that piece of bread they're eating is, is not part of Jesus. He's not even dead yet. He's alive, and he's sitting at the table with the rest of them. So uh, we don't really believe in the Eucharist being, you know, like a transubstantiation. I mean, it's, it's just a false teaching that was uh, brought along later in the time. But uh, obviously Athanasius had some... You know, had some sayings about this that obviously gets him in, in being liked by the Roman Catholics and so forth, as you said. This is not really a view of Roman Catholics or evangelicals at all, but it is a view in the Eastern Orthodox. Athanasius said that people become God. And, and there's a term for this doctrine, it's called theosis. Now, let me read what he wrote, and then I'll say what Eastern Orthodox believe in a little more detail. He said, for he, meaning Jesus, became man so that we might be made God. Boy, that sounds pretty problematic. This is an incarnation of the Word, chapter 54, page 65. He said, similar in four discourses against the Arians, discourse 1, chapter 15, page 316, and discourse 2, chapter 70, page 386, and he also said, therefore, he, Jesus, was not man and then became God, but he was God and then became man. So far, so good. And that to deify us. So Jesus is going to deify us. Boy, that sounds kind of scary. This is in four discourses against the Arians, Discourse 1, chapter 39, page 321. And also, you can see similar in Discourse 1, chapter 5, page 15, page 316. Now... If you think about Mormonism, they believe that people can become God and, uh, and they become separate gods and they're worshipped and they have their own plan. Okay, well, Eastern Orthodox have said, no, we don't believe that at all like Mormons believe. Uh, they believe they become part of the one God. They be believe they become part of the Godhead and not separate gods at all. Now, in 1 Peter 1, it says that we partake of the divine nature and so we do become more Christ-like. But the fact that we probably got head is like, well, um, you know, do you worship people that way? And Eastern Orthodox say, no, we don't worship people. But then again, they venerate people. And uh, Eastern Orthodox have told me that, well, if we had the words of our saints who have been, you know, deified on earth, that's just as good as scripture. And we actually wouldn't even need scripture, you know, if, when we have their words. Now, so it's like, this is kind of, you can see kind of Athanasius is off here, and you kind of see the trajectory of how it kind of got worse. And, you know, I really wish as an evangelical that he hadn't said this. <laughs> this is totally refuted by Scripture, like you're dealing with polytheists like Mormons or Hindus or any of these other false religious groups out there. But what I, one thing I always advise uh, my fellow Christians that are dealing with heretics like this, that uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 44, chapter 45, and chapter 46 come in very handy in dealing with people that like to 
say they're part of the God family, like Herbert W. Armstrong used to say, it was the Worldwide Church of God, you know, part of God and all that, uh, and these other groups. But, uh, when, you know, just a cursory looking at, in Isaiah 44, I'm looking at verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. And then verse 8, Hear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told ye thee from the time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Therefore, is there a God besides me? Question mark. Yea, there is no God. I know not any. And if God does, know, does not know of any other gods out there, then there must not be any other gods out there besides him. It says, Thus saith the Lord, this is verse 24, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord, and maketh all things, and stretches forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. It just goes on, verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God besides me. I girded thee, uh, though thou hast not known me. And it just goes on to, to, to talk about things like this. Uh, you look down at verse 14. Surely God is is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. And uh, I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 18. Over and over again, verse 21. A just God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Chapter 46, Isaiah 46, start verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. And it just goes on and on. So for Athanasius to say this in light of just point blank scriptures that refute anybody that would think that they're going to become part of God or be God or be a God of their own planet, like the Mormons say, uh, it's just kind of ridiculous. Yeah, another thing that evangelicals, Protestants, and Roman Catholics would not agree with is that Jeremiah and John the Baptist were born with no sinful nature, according to Athanasius. So Athanasius believed that all people were born with a sinful nature, almost. Here's his quote. Many, for instance, have been made holy and clean from all sin. Nay, Jeremiah was hallowed even from the womb, and John, while yet in the womb, leapt for joy at the voice of Mary, bearer of God. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam and Moses, even over those who had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. This is in Four Discourses Against the Arians, Discourse 3, chapter 33, page 411. So he believed that people could become free from all sin in this life. You know, they, they, they had a sinful nature, they sinned, but through theosis or whatever, they become sinless eventually in this life. Uh, he also said John the Baptist, because he had the, the Bible says he had the Holy Spirit from before birth and left in the womb, therefore he had no sinful nature. The Bible doesn't say that. Also in Jeremiah 1, God says that before he was born, he knew Jeremiah and appointed him a prophet. Therefore, Athanasius extrapolates that Jeremiah had no sinful nature either. We, we, we find that since Adam... And Romans chapter 5 makes this clear that uh, that there is original sin, starting with Adam. And this is enunciated uh, quite completely in uh, Romans chapter 5, uh, that men have a sinful nature. You know, when you put your, your kid in a, 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 a playpen with maybe their little, little brother or sister, and they're both very young, and there's one little ball there. They're already fighting over the ball. It's selfishness. You know, you get pride. You get all those things that are mentioned in the scripture of the evil, wicked, sin nature that we have. Because uh, as Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees in John chapter 6, uh, verse 44, a year of your, your father the devil, and you seek to do his will. Uh, so that the problem is... Uh, we all have a sinful nature, and the scripture makes it quite clear, as you brought out from the scriptures you brought up as well, and it's, it's everywhere. It's uh, the doctrine of original sin is there, and to deny that, well, you know, you're starting to get into plagian heresy and things of that. Right. Nature. But anyway, moving on, Athanasius taught that people could lose their salvation 
All right, but there were 11 other pre-Nicene Christian writers who also believed they could lose your salvation. Now, among evangelicals, many believe that you can lose your salvation. Most Charismatics, Biblical Lutherans, Biblical Anglicans, and there are some Biblical you know, Methodists, they believe you can lose salvation. But then there are many other evangelicals, uh, uh, Baptists and Reformed and others, that say, no, you can't lose your salvation. Though there is such a thing as counterfeit salvation. And Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox all pretty much believe you can lose your salvation. Okay, the other thing about free choice, Athanasius said that some souls departed from truth by abuse of freedom of choice. This is in Athanasius against the heathen, chapter 1, page 5 through 6. Some Calvinists say that we don't have free choice, but we do have responsibility and maybe free agency, while others, especially more Arminians, are very big on saying that we do have either totally free will or somewhat free will or something like that. Okay. And then another thing is that he said that Christ died for all people. Uh, Athanasius died for all. And by the suffering of death, takes the death of every man in incarnation of the word. Chapter 10.2, page 41. Also, Ibid, chapter 7.5, page 40. He said, Jesus ransomed the sins of all in the incarnation, 40.2, page 57. Also, incarnation of the word, 25.4, page 50. And that Christ died as a ransom for all. The incarnation of the word, chapter 21.7, page 48. And no one prior to Nicaea denied that, and there are four other writers who, who affirmed it. Now, many Calvinists would say that Christ did not die for all, but for the elect. Everyone would say that his death only had any benefit for those who are the elect and who are going to heaven. So Calvinists are among the many people who all uh, esteem Athanasius, but even they would say Athanasius certainly is not right on everything. Since I'm a Calvinist myself, <laughs> I would obviously say you're right about what you're saying there. And uh, the fact is, uh, some of these things he's saying, as you've been listing off, can you lose your salvation? Well, obviously, I would disagree with that. The Scripture says quite clear, once you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, uh, you, you cannot lose your salvation. God, the Holy Spirit is within you, uh, and you're sealed unto eternity. I want to recommend our, our newsletter. How sovereign is God? I have a whole section on can you lose your salvation and all the scripture verses that go with it uh, when it comes to free choice. That was mentioned there in the newsletter. And Christ died for all people. And what's interesting about that is Christ, over and over again, it says in the scripture, Christ died for his people. There's the sheep and the goats. Christ gathers his sheep. He's the great shepherd on one side and the goats on the other. So it's obvious that if Christ died for everybody, then everybody would be saved, whether they believed or not, because they, they cover all sins, even their unbelief. So we can say that genuine Christians sometimes disagree on points, and even people who are biblicists could disagree on a point. But I think one thing we can agree upon is Athanasius was a good guy, but he wasn't a good enough guy for us to base our faith on. But kind of related to some of these issues, is, is a, another problem, is that Athanasius talked about how people can have a worthiness uh, related to salvation. So here's what he said. Now, he who has been counted worthy of the heavenly calling, and by this calling has been sanctified, if he grow negligent in it, although washed, becomes defiled. And this is in Easter letter 10, 338 AD, chapter 9, page 526. And he says, we too shall be counted worthy of these things if at all times we cleave to our Savior and if we are pure. Easter letter, chapter 10, page 527. And then he says, For when we have first meditated properly in these things, we shall attain to be counted worthy of those which are eternal through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is Easter letter 10, chapter 12, page 523. Uh, unfortunately, before him, there were 14 other pre-Nicene Christian writers who also taught this. Okay, now Martin Luther, Reformed Christians, Baptists, and Bible Church believers never say this. We would say, what percent of our going to heaven do we have because we are worth it? And we would answer unanimously, zero percent. Now, there is a worthiness to going to heaven, but that worthiness is in Christ. And that we have his worthiness, we have his virtue, we have his righteousness. We've, our righteousness is as filthy rags. 
Unfortunately, Athanasius didn't see it that way. So, I mean, yes, we are to try to live a worthy life, worthy of our salvation, but our worthiness doesn't merit us heaven in the least, not even partially. All right, another thing that Orthodox would not really like, and Roman Catholics wouldn't like either, as well as evangelicals, but cops or monophysites like, is that he was called a pope. So Constantine wrote a letter to, quote, Pope Athanasius, this is the R. Athanasius of Alexandria, in defense against Arians, chapter 64, page 133. And Athanasius are repeated this letter. And he wrote a letter to the Pope in Rome in defense against the Arians, chapter 67 to 68, page 135, in chapter 69, page 136. The first to be called Pope ever was the Pope Heraclius of Alexandria, not Rome, in 232 to 249 AD. And no Roman bishop was called Pope until Julius of Rome in 347 AD. And Syricius of Rome in 384 to 399 AD was the first Roman bishop to call himself a Pope. Okay, so Roman Catholics think there's only a Pope in Rome and he's the head of all Christianity, or, or should be head. And the Eastern Orthodox, they don't have a pope. They would have a patriarch kind of thing, but the patriarch is not such a high position like a pope. But the cops, and even back to Athanasius, they would have a pope. And, of course, you want to say, Larry, what Scripture says about that? Pope means papa or father. Oh, yes, the Scripture says, call, my, call no man father. Uh, on you know, on this, this earth, because only the God the Father should be called Father. Uh, okay. I've argued that over and over again with all kinds of Roman Catholics, but uh, they're so brainwashed into Roman Catholic theology, they, they buy right into what the Roman propaganda says about that, and they redefine everything, just like you said, we're talking earlier about cousins, that when you read the scripture, you don't find that, that Jesus' brothers and sisters were referred to as cousins. Uh, there is no pope uh, mentioned uh, per se that's part of the hierarchy or structure of the church. When you read First Timothy and Second Timothy, they give you elders and deacons. <laughs> you don't find a uh, a universal pope mentioned anywhere. You and I did an 18-part video series, 30 minutes each episode. We had several episodes in that 18-part series that dealt with Roman Catholicism. One of the series shows uh, dealt with the Pope. And one thing you made clear in that series is you don't really find the Roman Catholic hierarchy with popes and cardinals and all this kind of stuff in early church history, let alone the Bible itself. Athanasius' authority and words were accepted, and all the bishops, especially in Egypt, were happy to be under him. And he did a very valuable thing, you know, with the Council of Nicaea. But because of that, there would be easy to put somebody like him, who was a good guy, on a pedestal. And I think that's kind of how that happened, on, unfortunately, and the things just kind of got worse from there. Another thing that's kind of curious is that while evangelicals stress, let's just keep it simple. Let's just go to what God said himself. Let's just go to the Bible, not only because the Bible is true, but also because the Bible is sufficient. Okay, Roman Catholics say, yeah, the Bible's good, but you've got to have the other things, the Pope, the Church tradition, and the councils, and they kind of stress the councils. Well, Eastern Orthodox, they actually stress the councils far more than the than Roman Catholics. And I was kind of surprised to read this from Athanasius. This being pointed out, who will accept those who cite the Synod of Arminian or any other against the Nicene? So either... You think Athanasius is saying there don't need to be any more councils, or you're saying that there don't need to be any councils against the Nicene Council. Kind of ambiguous here. But let's look at the next quote. Vainly then do they run about with the pretext that they have demanded councils for the faith's sake. For divine scripture is sufficient above all things. But if a council be needed on the point, there are the proceedings of the fathers. For the Nicene bishops did not neglect this matter, but stated the doctrine so exactly the persons reading the words honestly cannot but be reminded them of the religion towards Christ announced in divine scripture. And this is on the Council of Arminium and Seleucia, chapter 6, page 453. So Athanasius, against the compromise, Nicene Council and Arians of Arminium, on the basis of it being another council. He said no more councils. He saw no need for any council afterwards. Now, of course, Athanasius did know about council after his death. 
But while the later councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon, they affirmed the Nicene Council, and they were not against the Nicene Council, they still kicked people out of the church, namely Nestorians and Copts, who did accept the Nicene Council. So Athanasius probably wouldn't have gone along with this. He said, look, the Nicene Council is the last council you're going to need. Uh, and this goes contrary to Eastern Orthodox that really accept what they call the seven ecumenical councils. And then uh, uh, multiple archangels. Athanasius taught about multiple archangels and four discourses against the Arians. Discourse 1, chapter 42, page 231. And Discourse 2, chapter 27, page 362. Now, multiple archangels are also mentioned by eight pre-Nicene writers, beginning with Irenaeus, and also archangels are mentioned by other groups, too. Now, of course, you say, well, if you're an evangelical, well, there's only one archangel in the Bible, Michael. Gabriel isn't mentioned as an archangel, though he does have an important role. Well, in the powerful books, they have other archangels, Raphael and, and stuff like that. So, you know, this may not be the most serious error, but this is another thing to where evangelicals say, well, we think Athanasius is incorrect. Another thing that maybe is not a big deal, but kind of galls me a little bit, is that things, I think, started going really bad when bishops started talking about their power and their thrones. He who would be great among you, Jesus said, should be your servant. He didn't say be sitting on a throne. And Athanasius, he mentioned the bishop who was still sitting on his throne when soldiers sent by the Arians attacked the church. In history of the Arians, chapter 81, page 301. Okay, now the first bit mention of a bishop on his throne was about the same time in Eusebius of the Ecclesiastical History, which is the 4th 340 AD. So it's like, I think things started going wrong in the organized church when bishops started appealing to their power on their throne. You combine the political power with religious power, and then that can certainly lead to abuse. Uh, yep. Absolute power on that level can corrupt absolutely, as the old cliche goes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these next things are not so much what he believed, but the way he went about things. He would say things were wrong. He would rebuke people. That's fine and that's needed. But sometimes he was, I think, almost too harsh. Here's one example in Four Discourses Against the Arians, Discourse 1, Chapter 53, page 337. Athanasius, he answers an area of objection on Hebrews 1, 4, talking about the Son and, you know, being, and, and being sent by the Father. And he said, the Son became superior to the angels. He said that if Arians deceive the thoughtless, so the poison of their heresy, and openly adopting Caiaphas's way, they determined on Judaizing and ignorant of the text that verily God shall dwell upon the earth. That's in Zechariah 2.10. Okay, so because they have a different view of Christ being greater than the angels and of Christ being less than God, that's wrong, fine. But to say that they're Judaizers because they believe that, to say they're like Caiaphas who believe that, that's just false slander. He kind of went a little overboard there. Insults are not an actual argument. If I, right. if I were to say you're a racist, uh, Islamophobe, because you have a website dealing with Islam, and you're a homophobe because uh, you may have read some of the scripture verses uh, that talked about homosexuality, and I just call you a bunch of names, that's not really an argument. That's just a bunch of slander and insult. Right. And Athanasius was a smart guy who actually did answer arguments very well but unfortunately he kind of messed up here and he didn't really answer the, their argument as much as just insulted them and thought well that's enough and so kind of disappointed in that actually then he says this is a part of what Arius and his followers vomited from their heretical hearts in on the synods chapter 16 page 458 so this is kind of too much it's like so you want to uh, debate like Athanasius no, <laughs> you, you, you certainly do not. In some ways, you know, yes, he was good, but you need to realize that the people who oppose you, they are people too. And, you know, debate them with logic and truth and facts. Don't just, don't just in, in, insult them with junk like this. And then finally, he was pretty good with scripture, but he had a, a ton of trivial errors. He called King Pharaoh. Well, Pharaoh kind of means the king of Egypt, so kind of a tautology that... You were never called King Pharaoh. In Four Discourse Against the Arians, Discourse 2, 27, 362, Athanasius said the Phoenicians invented letters. Actually, the Egyptian Sumerians were there before the, the Phoenicians, so 
Athanasius knew history pretty well, but not quite well enough. So maybe this, he should have just stuck to theology. In Athanasius against Heathen, part 1, chapter 9, that 2, page 9, I Alexander, Athanasius said that Theseus was the first to institute the worship of Greek gods. And actually, they were probably worshipped before Theseus even. So Athanasius was, was wrong here, but these are just small trivial things, so he's not inerrant by any means. Athanasius against the Heathen, part 1, chapter 9, about 4, page 9. And then finally, this is more a funny one than a serious one. In ancient Greek philosophy, Democritus and Leucippus were Greek philosophers that taught that something could only be cut up so far before it was just individual balls. And they call these tiny little balls atoms. And Athanasius denied that this about matter. He saw this as like a theological challenge on this. And on the council, chapter 35, page 469. Yes. This is understandable. Prior to him, 10 pre-Nicene Christian writers also wrote that atoms were wrong or ridiculous. And there, Justin Martyr, the office of Antioch, Irenaeus of Lyon, a Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Hippolytus, of Portus, Origen, Dionysus of Alexandria, Arnobius, and Lactanius. Now, a single writer said that atoms are not wrong, or that God might use atoms. They didn't think that maybe, you know, the Bible's true and atoms are also true. So early Christian was crystal clear on this. And one thing we can learn is the early church tradition of godly men can speak loudly with one voice in something and still be totally wrong. So while they said many good things on other topics, this shows that we cannot put the way that Christian tradition on the same level as Holy Scripture. One thing we find Jesus condemning the scribes and the Pharisees for over and over again, particularly if you read Matthew chapter 15, he was always condemning them for putting their traditions on the same plane or even above the Word of God. You can almost read the whole mm -hmm. chapter of Matthew 15 for, for proof of that. So that's a very big danger in this life is to take human traditions that can look so true but end up being so false and put in contrast to the Word of God. And also he had uh, various other small scientific errors. Here are some three examples. He said the winds are caused by the burning heat of the upper air. Well, actually the upper air is very cold. Athanasius against the heathen, part 1, chapter 27.7, page 18. He discusses when the sun is under the earth, you know, how the sun at least appears to go above the earth, you know, until nighttime, then maybe it sets, then does it go underneath the earth? Well, later Muslims and Muhammad taught that too. And Athanasius taught that also, and they're all wrong. This is Athanasius against the heathen, part 2, chapter 29 at 2, page 19. He also said that the earth is set on the waters of the world, and Athanasius against the heathen, part 1, chapter 27, dot 6, page 18. So Athanasius was no 19th or 20th century scientist. That's fine if this is his opinion, but don't teach your opinion, you know, as fact if it's just your opinion. You have sort of a scientific background yourself. Now, you have a Ph.D. in what? Uh, chemical engineering. I mean, the fallacy of these statements really comes true. Some could say, oh, I give Athanasius a break. I, I, I mean, he lived in, in, in a, you know, pre-scientific society. And granted that, the, you, you know, you can understand that. But just to say you can't put him on the level of Scripture. These are all the problems I saw with Athanasius. But then on, on the other hand, I did list all the, the, the good things about Athanasius because, quite frankly, there are just too many to list. <laughs> there are just hundreds of other good things. And these good things, uh, Orthodox, Roman Catholics, and Evangelicals would all agree that these things are true. So we can understand why everyone likes Athanasius, perhaps at the expense of overlooking some of the teachings that they strongly object to, such as the acceptance of origin and proto historian leading teaching. So let's try to address the question, at least. Which group today was Athanasius most like? Okay, so let's kind of work through this. He was similar to most churches today, except for his high regard for origin. But he was not 100% consistent with any major church today. So who was he most like? Well, his view of scripture was probably most like an evangelical. However, he did have a strong view of bishop tradition like Roman Catholics. However, he was not most like either one. He was, to my opinion, kind of like an iconoclastic Eastern Orthodox or perhaps an historian. Now, icons are a very key part of Eastern Orthodoxy, but there was one Byzantine emperor 
uh, uh, Leo the First, that was an iconoclast and said, you know, all these icons and images are wrong. We don't need to look at pictures when we look at God. And uh, he, after his death, uh, they all kind of went back. Athanasius, he had some similarity to Eastern Orthodox, but it had nothing to do with images. So every place that a Roman Catholic could point to him being like a Roman Catholic, an Eastern Orthodox could point to the same place and say he's like an Eastern Orthodox just as much or even more. Now, he would have been like a Copt, and the Copts really accept him as one of the bishops, except that he did have the one historian-leading teaching. So if Athanasius says scripture was sufficient and scripture says nothing about venerating pictures of people and he never advocated it either, then venerating pictures of people must not have been important to him. It's a very key point for Eastern Orthodox to understand. To summarize the evangelical view of Athanasius, Athanasius's flaws don't cause evangelical as much of a problem as some people might think because we don't follow Athanasius anyway. We do admire him as a great believer, however. He was a dedicated, though flawed, Christian who accomplished much despite his imperfections. We can emulate his good points and forget his bad points. So praise God for Athanasius, but don't follow Athanasius. He's just a follow a godly believer who reminds us to follow God. Anyway, any final comments, brother, before we sign off? Um, just uh, go back to God's Word. We can learn from other Christians, but don't base your faith in them. Base it just in God's Word. Steve, thanks for being with us. I want to tell the folks out there, uh, join us again next time for another episode of In Christian Answers Presents. And just remember this from the words of Jesus, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So it's by Jesus. How do you find out about Jesus? Through the Word of God, as Steve and me have been saying all along. Stick to the Word of God. Get to know God as presented in the scripture. And through the power of his Holy Spirit, you'll be able to believe, learn, and live the life of Christ. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.